Good afternoon um, and welcome. Um, so my name is Connell Pugh um, and I currently work at Axis Digital. Um, and this project um, I founded only probably three months ago now um, called Prograd. And the, the purpose of this project was for me to see how I can help graduates final years um, improve their personal branding and in turn improve their chances of gaining the job of their dreams um, and gaining employment. So yeah, as I said, um, I'm Connell Pugh. Um, I used to attend DMU. Um, I graduated last year um, from law school um, and now yeah, I work in digital marketing. So it's a bit of a change um, from what I intended my path to be. Um, but yeah, here we are now and I'll be going through how I got there and all the speed bumps and all the top tips that I sort of was taught through experienced people. Um, and now it's sort of, I feel like it's my turn to give back. Um, so yeah, so today is mainly, we're going to be discussing my story. So as I just said, sort of how I got to where I am now um, and all the sort of trials and tribulations that came across with that, which is always an interesting story. Um, and it sort of gives me a bit of credibility as to why I'm doing this speech and, and why or why you should listen as well. Um, so yeah, and also I'm going to cover areas that people go wrong um, and problems and solutions um, to hopefully you know, put you at ease because obviously there are a lot of things that go wrong when trying to find a job, a lot of sort of hardship that can come along um, and sort of the aim of this presentation and this project is to help people um, through, those, through those speed bumps and, and hopefully, you know, to some, some success as well. Um, and also what sets you apart? Um, I won't say too much about that because um, I'll obviously cover it later. So my story, um, as I said, my name is Connell Pugh. Um, I graduated from DMU um august last year which seems a lifetime away considering where, what we've all been through in terms of covid and the pandemic and all that kind of stuff um so yeah a bit about my background um i was born and raised in leicester um obviously studied in leicester um even when i moved out um into a house with my girlfriend i moved about four miles away from the house that i grew up in so very very much a fan of Leicester. Um, I have travelled around. I've not just stayed in Leicester, um, but yeah, I'm born, born and bred Leicester boy. Um, although I don't support Leicester City, um, I actually support Nottingham Forest, um, but I don't tend to well, publicise that too much, especially with um, currently what they're doing in the league. But anyway, that's a different point. Um, bit of a fun sort of insight. I'm a very big fan of uh, burgers. Um, I thought this was a bit of an interesting thing. So there used to be a burger place near DMU called the Handmade Burger Co. And I can proudly say within my three years at De Montfort University, I tried every single burger on the menu. Um, probably not a great thing to shout about, but it's not something that's on my CV, but it's something I am proud of. Um, but yeah, so if I was ever on death row and had a choice of my last meal, it'd be a, it'd be a burger with a milkshake. Um, so yeah. Um, interesting one, I actually failed my A-levels. So obviously most people see graduates um, and uni students, people that, you know, done the GCSEs, done the A-levels and went on to university where, in fact, I failed my A-levels. I'd done half decent first first year of A-levels and then, unfortunately, I managed to break my hip playing rugby, um, which meant that I missed a lot, a lot of valuable um, teaching time um, at my college. And I'm still foolishly trying to, trying to pass my A-levels in order to get to university. Um, and after missing six, seven months of of school, um, as you can imagine, it really affected my exam results because um, I knew about the first two two questions of the exam and that was about it. So yeah, after I failed my A-levels, I was sort of looking around thinking, what what can I do? I want to go to university, um, but obviously don't have the UCAS points in order to get in. So I was, you know, I contemplated many things, um, you know, just getting a job because at that point I was old enough just to go into work. Um, but I, I sort of took a step back and then I actually went back to college um, and did a BTEC diploma, um, which was sort of an alter alternative um, pathway into university because it enabled me to get, get enough UCAS points in order to apply. Um, so I did a BTEC diploma in business and law, which is when I found my passion and interest in law um, and then obviously went off to, uh, to Montfort University. So whilst at DMU, um, I was working on the SCG programs that the university run throughout all different faculties and departments. Um, and I suppose the pinnacle of the work that I was doing whilst, whilst at university with my law degree was being invited to the United Nations headquarters in New York. And still to this day, I have to pinch myself that that picture is actually me. Um, and that was me at the front of uh, the assembly hall, um, basically lecturing 
people far older and far more experienced than me on how to, I suppose, change the world and make the world a better place. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of a pinnacle thing. And I suppose the reason why, the, apart from it's a cool thing to say, but the reason why I, I like to mention this is really this opportunity came around through personal branding, which is obviously what ProGrad is all around. Um, and it was it was an interesting journey because when I started university, I was one of those one of those people that was literally sat at the back of the lecture hall with my hood up thinking, I'm just going to get my degree, go home. Um, wasn't interested in sort of extracurricular stuff, even making friends to some extent. I was just literally sat at the back with my hood up, listening, writing, going home. Um, but it wasn't until I sort of had a word with some wise old guru um i won't mention his name because he, he still works at um, dmu um but he sort of said that you know there are everyone graduates or almost everyone graduates with a degree um at the end of the three years four years or whatever it may be but there's only a certain amount of things that will set you apart you know because the x amount of people come out with a first a second degree but what actually puts you above the others um and it was for me that's when the penny dropped that I needed to get myself out there. Um, and obviously it was scary. Um, you know, for me, I wasn't exactly the most sociable, definitely wasn't the most confident person, but I knew that's what it would have took to really sort of elevate my, not only my university experience, but my future career path as well, because it added all these extra things onto my CV that no one else had. So one person had that they had a law degree, but I had my law degree. I had my UN experience. I had all these other part-time jobs that I took on as well. And they all came through personal branding. So even though I didn't feel it at the time, you know, I was acting, I suppose you will, um, confident and professional. Um, I'd always like to consider myself as professional, but confident, definitely not. But I had to walk into rooms, you know, with people, interviews, even ask for jobs and say, you know, I'm, I'm this person. I can do this. I can do this for you. And because it's quite a rare thing these days to have someone, you know, be, it's not even bold, but I suppose bold is the only word that comes to mind, but bold enough to be, you know, confident um, and brave. It really, it really does, does, does well for your, you know, your reputation and opportunities become more frequent. So my first thing was uh, I went on a DMU global trip um, and that was a very nervous thing. So as I mentioned earlier, I was born and raised in Leicester. I actually first went abroad with DMU global. First time I ever went out of, I think the furthest I've ever been is about Skegness, which is about 100 miles away. But with DM Global, I then went to Berlin, um, Germany. And that's when, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember quaking in my boots, putting my hands up at this, this massive talk um, and asking a couple of questions. But the rush that I got from that in terms of the boost of confidence, so actually, you know, it's not all that bad actually when you actually be in front of people, talk to people. Um, and that got me noticed by by someone who then offered me a job. Um, and that was sort of my first foot in the door of DMU with all these amazing opportunities, which inevitably led to speaking at the United Nations in my second year. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of a, an insight to how personal branding got me these opportunities and experiences and in turn made my CV a lot more fuller and a lot more good looking, I suppose. So, yeah, um, last year I graduated law school and I somehow managed to pull I rabbit out the hat and got a first uh, first class degree in in law, um, but be, I suppose before I even graduated, I realised that I wasn't destined to work in the field of law. Despite my experience, obviously doing a law degree and going to the United Nations, I realised that it wasn't really for me, um, and that's quite common in in graduates. Um, I know most of my friends they all done completely different degrees, and when it comes to graduating and then entering the world of work, there was like don't really want to do what I've been studying for the last three, four, five years. Um, and that's exactly where I found myself. And at first I was absolutely petrified in my head. I was thinking I've just wasted three years of my life. Um, you know, I've got, well, I've got student debt wrapped around my neck now. Um, what the hell am I going to do? But what I failed to see was all of the opportunities that came around from being confident, from putting yourself out there, made me a lot more employable. So not only had, do I have a degree, but as I mentioned, I had all these extra things that I could add on to my CV, which in turn were transferable skills um, and impressive transferable skills as well. And that's why it's not that scary when you don't know what you want to do. And it's something that I go on later um, to, to talk about. So, yeah, so I sort of gave a bit of my background, um, but a little bit more. So I played rugby. Uh, I tried to play rugby um, three, I think three weeks ago now. I managed to break my hip um, again. This is the second time and tear my ACL in my right knee. So I'm currently um, semi-retired, potentially looking to do full-time retirement. Um, 
But yeah, so I played rugby, um, obviously studied law, done a bit of work with the United Nations. And then after university, well, before I actually graduated, um, I was offered a job in a wealth management firm. Um, and that really came through LinkedIn, um, connecting, having a good personal brand on there, looking professional, looking, you know, looking like I wanted to, to get a job, um, which was you know, a great position to be in. Um, it was, I know it wasn't going to be the, the be all and end all having this job, but having obviously a job secured before you graduate is, is, is a comfortable place to be. Um, and I can honestly say it isn't through being, you know, a, a mastermind or a genius or anything like that. It was simply understanding that putting the groundwork in before you need to build the foundations almost is a great is, is a great sort of thing to have in mind when you're coming up to your final years. But even even if you've already graduated, there's always time to start building, to starting on the groundwork of these connections, making sure that your profiles look professional and all that kind of thing, because it really does pay dividends as you go through a um, like a recruitment process. So when I was thinking about ProGrad starting up, the first place I looked was myself and um, looked at where I went wrong. Um, I still go wrong now and that's part of life. Um, but where I went wrong as sort of a, a student and then a graduate is sort of where I started. And then I spoke to other people in my year that obviously were great, recently graduated at the time um, and also even some final year students now that I've managed to connect with and sort of asked, you know, things that go wrong. And um, so the first one is obviously uh, an incomplete and unprofessional looking profiles, which I sort of touched on earlier. So LinkedIn is obviously, I suppose it's the online professional social media platform um, where, you know, top business people, employers um, and employees all hang around and obviously talk about, I suppose it can be quite boring stuff, but professional stuff, shall we say. Um, I'm one of those people. Um, and it's important to make sure, you know, you look professional. You sort of, I suppose you, you may have heard of like, you know, dress for the job that you want. Um, and for me, when I was graduating, my profile picture was me holding a jug of beer um, you know maybe if I was trying to get a work in a brewery it might have worked but obviously I was looking for sort of more office-based jobs um, and unfortunately you don't drink too much beer in the office so I, I knew I had to change my profile picture I actually found a photographer that offered a free headshot to graduates and that was my like sort of step one into looking somewhat professional having you know I had my suit on a good you know a good picture taken um, and that was sort of the first step but it seems a small step, but small steps add up. Um, I, you know, I think of the Eiffel Tower. I remember walking up the Eiffel Tower, and they're only small steps, but once you get to the top, you realise how far you've come and how important it is to take those steps. And, yeah, so having a good-looking profile picture and a complete one as well, um, whether it's, you know, if you're still studying, you say what you're studying, say stuff that you've been working on, because it makes you makes you interesting as well because then people know what you like um, and then people may even ask you questions about it and straight away you can build a connection that you never know who knows somebody else as well um, and that's essentially how I secured my my grad job was talking about stuff that I was doing looking professional acting professional and then soon enough an opportunity came along um, and I took it with both hands second one um, this is quite a funny one is obviously going through your social media accounts um, and this more relates to making sure there's nothing embarrassing on there. So a friend of mine, um, his, he applied for a, a law firm, a quite a reputable law firm. And he went into his interview, passed like the application part, fine colours, you know, sort of well um, qualified for the, for the graduate role in this law firm. And when he sat down with the, the interviewer, the first thing that he'd done was put a picture of him blackout drunk um, on the table and said, do you know where this was from? And it was on his Instagram um because he had a public instagram and it's sort of it's just understanding that the, the social media world that we live in is a window into our into our lives our personalities um and it's important that if it is public you know you're portraying the right things because you know you see all the time footballers getting into trouble for something they tweeted about five ten you know ten years ago um and you know stuff like that can soon come up to uh, to haunt you and so it's important to either make sure everything's private or make sure there's nothing embarrassing I a picture of you on a student night out that's you know not exactly um, professional looking, shall we say? So that's always a, a, a an area where some people fall down on, um, and that goes into not researching enough. So this is more on researching the business that you're applying for because there's nothing worse than than someone asking you a question you don't know that you should know the answer to and you don't. 
Um, I, I always find it comforts me as well, knowing a lot about whatever I'm doing, even if it's so in my role, I have a lot of client meetings. I will do everything I can to find as much as about that person because it puts me at ease. I know what they like um, and I know how to then, you know, build conversations around it. And it makes you look like you're interested in the person. And obviously for those applying for jobs, it makes you look like you're actually interested in the job, the business and the person sat in front of you. But it can also stop you from um, applying for a job that isn't meant for you. So a lot of jobs have, you know, fancy titles that are obviously built to attract certain people when in reality the title won't match the day-to-day jobs that you do and that's quite a key thing is where research comes in um you know if you type in whatever the title is that you're applying for you have a better understanding of what you could be doing day to day and that's you know also comes into where research um and that falls nicely with poor approach because as i said if, if um, an employer an interviewer then goes oh what do you think about this current project that we're working on and you're sat there with, you know, birds flying around your head thinking, I've not got a single clue what this person's talking about. It's a poor approach. It's not going to do you any favours not knowing the answer. Um, and that's, again, sort of where the research comes in. But also poor approach is obviously being professional. You know, don't be turning. I know this seems obvious, but I know people we've had, we've just done a recruitment drive for someone to work in, in my team. Um, and the amount of graduates that turned up in tracksuit bottoms. Um, and it's not to be... It's not being stereotypical or anything like that, but it's it's showing a level of respect and, and professionalism and etiquette, basic sort of office place etiquette, etiquette, sorry. Um, and it's it's a it's a cool it's a cool way to show how serious and professional you are. Because I know whenever I apply for an interview, I wear a suit, wear a tie, make sure my top button's done up. It sounds like um, a parent's telling you how to dress for school, but you know it does really send send a message before you even sat down you know think of it if think of it if you're going on a date and you know you you, you've dressed up nicely picked up an outfit um and you sit there waiting for a date and then they turn up you know that you know in in their scruffs or whatever it's just the wrong image before they even sat down you're going to switch off and not be interested so just think of it as think of it that way um and the last one this is sort of a bit of a i don't know i'm not gonna say spiritual but a, a gut feeling sort of thing that I missed is that the job can be wrong for you. Um, and I know, like I say, when I, I had this graduate job, I knew it was I knew it was wrong for me. Um, but obviously I took it because it was sort of a good opportunity. But a lot of people feel under a lot of pressure to take a job as soon as they graduate. And obviously there are many different external pressures, whether it's financial, parents, even societal pressures. But it's ensuring you don't sort of do something you don't want to do because naturally you won't do a good job at it. Um, you know, it's like if someone said you need to count how many toothpicks are in this jar, you know, you, you're not going to want to do it. You're not going to do a good job. Um, and it's it's the same thing in real life. You know, if you do a job that you don't want to be in, naturally the passion's not there. And when the passion's not there, the quality's not there. Um, I talk a bit more about having the wrong job for you um, a bit later in a couple of slides. So, yeah, so these are some problems that I found. Um, and Throughout the next slides, I give solutions or sort of solutions and maybe some words of wisdom from experiences that I came across. Um, but yeah, obviously stuff like confidence, no experience, wrong applications um, and finding the right job or the wrong job. Um, so yeah, let's, let's have a look at some of these problems. First one is confidence. Now confidence can only ever come from yourself. It's, you know, your parents can believe you, your friends can believe you, your boyfriend your girlfriend you know whoever your teachers can believe in you but in reality the most important person is yourself and you've got to build that confidence up in yourself and um, because it will it, it will pay dividends so much moving forward in all walks of life so not just getting a job you know if you're trying to find the love of your life your husband your wife um, whoever it may be confidence is key um you know someone someone that's extremely confident you can sense it soon as, before they've even said a word. As soon as they walk in, you can tell that if someone's confident or not. And I, obviously, going back to what I said earlier, I wasn't confident at all. Um, if you asked me to do this talk, well, probably I'd probably say three, four years ago, I would have been, you know, absolutely trembling. I, I would have said no. That would have been my first answer. Um, but the way that I sort of got over it and increased my confidence was taking small steps, taking small opportunities, and enjoying the small wins. Um, whether that would be so for me my first step at university was literally putting my hand up and asking a lecturer a question in the middle of a lecture and um, you know you know it's in front of a couple of hundred people sometimes 
Um, and that was a very scary thing for me. Um, but that was one small thing that I could do. Didn't go wrong, didn't die, still here to talk about it. Um, and that's what you sort of had to teach myself that like, you know, what's the worst that could happen apart from nothing really. Um, you know, you might mumble your words sometimes, but everyone does that and everyone's human. But it's a good, it's a good sort of um, pathway to take in building confidence. Because for me, confidence can soon take the snowball effect. Once you do one thing, you know, you're pushing it up, pushing it up the hill. And once you've got to the tip, top of the hill where you've done a lot of stuff, a lot of small steps, it, then you're on the downward hill and you naturally will grow more confident, whether that would be. So when I applied for this job, I had to do a presentation and I was like, great, not very, you know, not exactly confident in this. But because I'd done other things before, I was like, no, I've got this. It's a good little sort of stepping stone to do is to small things, whether it's saying hello to a stranger. It builds that confidence in, you know, exposing yourself as well. Um to to the outside world because in reality when you apply for jobs you're going to have to do that anyway so why not be doing it confidence because confident breeds comfortability and if you're comfortable doing something the other person on the other side feels more relaxed as well and it just makes for a better experience and increases the chance of them liking you which then in turn you know hopefully leads to a job offer not hearing back now Unfortunately, I, I don't have a solution for this um, because I'm, I'm not the I'm not the employer um, for everyone. But for me, not hearing back is all about understanding that unfortunately is part of the process of not hearing back. Um, you know, I applied for jobs that had 5000 applicants. Um, and if you think of it from the other side, if you're you're the person advertising for that job and you've had 5000 people ping in an email to you, are you really going to be wanting to sit there and send an email back 5,000 times to say, unfortunately, you know, you've not got it this time sort of thing. Um, and yeah, it's just accepting it's a part of the process of trying to get a job. Um, it's not a knockback. It doesn't mean you're not any good. It just simply means you've not got the job. Because, um, you know, I went through, I can't, countless job applications um, when I was trying to get this role. Um, and it you know it can feel a bit of a, a bit of a kick in the teeth when you don't hear back you think well what am i doing wrong um am i really that bad why is no one wanting to hire me or even talk to me um but in reality that it's just a part of the system it's not nice you know some companies and they're great companies and they will email me and say you know you, you've been unsuccessful this time um but don't ever see it as a knockback that you're not good enough i always see it that you know the job's not right for you which obviously leads back to what I mentioned earlier, because at the end of the day, you know, there could be a job that you think that's the job for me. This is absolutely what I want to do. But in reality, that job won't suit you um, as well. You know, it could be too much pressure, could be too much paperwork, or whatever it is that you didn't think about. So I always, I suppose it's a very positive um, way of thinking, but I always see it as a blessing in disguise because um, I, I actually applied to join the police. Um, before before starting here, I was going through a police application to be a detective because they do a graduate role, uh, which is a great opportunity. Um, and I didn't get the role, but in hindsight, it was probably a blessing because I would have been working, you know, ridiculous hours. And obviously, having a partner as well makes it difficult. Uh, we're now expecting our first child as well, um, which you know would have just added far more complications by being a police officer. So for me, that was a blessing in disguise. And I'd like to think all the other job applications and jobs that I didn't get were a blessing in disguise. So not hearing back, think of it as a positive thing um, and just move on to the next one. Finding a mentor. Uh, so I know obviously DMU, DMU for Life, they have a great mentor um, program. Um, but also it could be a mentor doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a successful person. It could be someone that's just that you like that you know that you trust their 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 advice that they would give you um so i s sought out a mentor and um, he actually ended up being my mentor for my dissertation as well um he was a lecturer in in um in my time at university and it was just great because it was someone that you could just you know uh ask questions ask advice and even silly questions because if you have a good relationship you can go you know you can ask a, a stupid question um and not feel stupid about it because you know it's your mentor it's your friend and a mentor can be a great, you know, really great for your confidence. Um, you can practice things with them. You can say, do you mind having a look at my CV? And this is where I sort of see myself being now because I had a good fortune of having a great mentor. And I always have like an open door policy. If any student or anyone doesn't necessarily have to be students or graduates, you know, they want to have a question and want to have a chat with me from, you know, from their CV to 
what they should name their new puppy um, I'm more than happy to sort of accommodate that and it's, it's, it's a good good thing you don't have to have a mentor but for me it's a great little sort of extra sort of um, a bit of experience that you can rely on when going through this journey of finding a job um, and No experience. Now, this again, I, no experience means you haven't got experience. I can't give you experience. I can't share your experience. So again, I suppose I don't have a solution for this. I'm sort of selling myself short here. Um, and you know, the, you know, sometimes obviously you can look for graduate roles and they want six years experience. Um, you know, thinking, hang about, I've only graduated two minutes ago. Um, how do you expect me to have six years experience? Um, and it's true. Uh, you know, uh, employers these days do ask for quite a lot. Um, from people, especially graduates, and it's sort of like, how the hell do I do this? And do I clone myself? Do I go back in time? Should I build a time machine sort of thing? But experience for me is quite a, a loose term. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I play rugby. Um, obviously, rugby is a team sport. If on an application it mentions, you know, we need someone that's happy to work in a team. I may have never worked in a team before, but I've relied on my rugby i said oh i've worked in teams i do this i'm good at communicating between team people and that's where the personal branding side comes into it again it's how you word stuff how you phrase stuff how essentially you put the professional spin on things so you know i've never worked in a team before but i mentioned that i had teamwork experience in communicating in large numbers obviously for those that know rugby it's 15 people not massively large number but it was a way for me to come across more professional and in reality, it is being professional because you're thinking on your feet and you're utilizing what you've got. But also a good way to get over no experience is get experience. Um, I'm going to sound like an employer now, but through my time at university um, and even now, I'm always looking for these extra opportunities that I can gain because it might not be direct experience. It might not be exactly what it says on the uh, job, job description, whatever, but it's transferable. So whether it's, you know, volunteering at a charity um, that's always great stuff, easy stuff to do. It doesn't take that much time. Um, but even doing your own things, whether it's, you know, have an interesting hobby, if you word it and phrase it and frame it in a certain way, it will help you gain more experience indirectly as well as make you look like you've got experience. Um, and it's quite a, a niche way of getting over, you know, these people that want six years experience when you've been graduated two minutes. Long applications. Now, I applied for a government job, um, and for those that are listening that apply for a government job, I can probably hear your your grief coming out because they are the most laborious, long-winded applications you could ever come across, um, they're, and they're not even fun to look at. They're like boring times, new Roman font, um, and it's just not fun. But this sort of links into what I was saying about applying for the wrong job for you. So. The, the example that I like to use is someone offered me a job as a chief burger taster on £10 million a month, but the application was 25 pages long. I'd sit there and do the application. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it was a problem. I wouldn't be huffing and puffing about it. I might get frustrated because obviously it is long and it takes time, but you would push for it. And, and this goes for, I suppose, anything in life. If it is, if it is something that you truly want, you, you will cross any path that needs to be crossed you will jump over any hurdle and get over any any walls that are put in your way because it's something that you truly want and this sort of goes back to the gut feeling of of understanding the type of person that you are and where you're best suited and um, so I, I worked in wealth management which is very corporate very serious you know I'm looking after people's money at the end of the day um, and it wasn't I enjoyed it it was a good brain exercise as I like to say you know it wasn't the most relaxed job in the world but what I didn't enjoy is having to be Mr. Serious all the time. Um, it just wasn't me. You know, I'm naturally a smiley person, naturally, you know, sociable person, like to have a laugh here and there. Um, and it just wasn't for me. And, you know, the application for that was, wasn't that long, which is, was an issue because then I just applied for it. But going back to the Chief Burger job, I, well, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't exist. If it does, I'll be applying shortly. Um, you know, I would move mountains to, to to do whatever needed to do in order to get a chance to get that job. And that's something really to consider each time you're looking for a job, each time you come across a hurdle. Like I say, it doesn't, this is, I suppose, a, a life lesson, really, um, that if it is something that you truly want, and that's a question only you can answer, there's nothing that should get any way to stop you from achieving that or getting the job. Not knowing what to do. Um, this was definitely me. Um, as I said, I, you know, done law, didn't want to go into law. 
got off the job in wealth management. Didn't really want to do wealth management. And I was looking around thinking, you know, what on earth am I going to do? Um, and again, this is something that needs to be accepted. Um, there are so many jobs in so many sectors, industries, countries, continents around now. Like the modern day that we're in is just ridiculous to different types of jobs. Like you go back 100 years, it was very sort of, you know, sector by sector. You knew sort of what job you was going to do, whether it was like an office job, labor job. But now, you know, there are jobs that people are training for that don't technically exist. Um, and that might scare people. Um, but for me, it's quite comforting that, you know, I can look in front and not have a clue what's in front of me. But I have the confidence, which goes back to obviously growing a confidence in myself um, that I will be able to overcome whatever comes and find something. Opportunities always come around. Like I always see it like positive karma. If you do a lot of good things, naturally, that good thing will come around and, and reward you. Um, and that's something, you know, it took me a while to get my head around and really understand and appreciate and trust that process. Um, you know, when I, I was applying for this job, I was thinking, this is for me, this is the right job. But it was. And obviously, I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I, I've only been in it six months. Um, I've been promoted twice. Um, just recently, um, I was made director of business strategy, which is insane. Um, but that's what I mean. Good things happen to good people that do good things. Um, and that goes back to gaining experiences. So if you start volunteering, might not feel like much at the time, might feel like a chore, but you're gaining experience, you're adding stuff on your CV and you're naturally doing a good thing, which for me will always pay, you know, always come back to pay you, you know, handsomely um, sort of thing. And, and yeah, there's just so much out there where years ago, the job market, everyone could get a job. Now it's a bit more competitive, but you know, there's even the option to set up your own, own business these days. It's an easy thing to do. There are that many areas that are expanding, especially in the technology part. Um, so I find it quite comforting that, you know, you might not know what to do um, because it, it gives you a chance to be creative, gives you a chance to really ask questions and really find a job that's, that's right for you. Interview skills. Um, these are obviously something that some people lack, um, especially if you've never applied for a job. It could be your first interview straight out of university. Um, but like all the top sports people in the world, practice makes perfect. Find a friend, find a mentor. If you find a mentor to go through a mock interview scenario, um, there you know there's thousands of hours of content on YouTube that cover interview skills. Some I wouldn't trust. Some you know are more trustworthy than others. Um, but you know, like myself, if if anyone listening you know has an interview coming up, I'm always open to you know sort of go for a mock interview or give some tips or advice. Um, but a good thing with interview that links back. See, I've, I've thought a lot about this presentation. Everything links in one way or another is the research. Um, I think it was Kobe Bryant that said there's something, there's something along the lines is there's no such thing as nerves. It's just being unprepared. And it's so true. If you know exactly what you're going to say, you know exactly about the business, exactly about the interviewer in front of you, you're naturally going to be more relaxed because there's less unknown things happening. Um, and that will naturally make you look more confident, make you more comfortable in the interview. And, you know, it just increases your chances of getting a job because you're more confident, you're more comfortable and you know what you're doing. Um, it's like anything, like an exam, your final year is coming up for your exams. Um, the more you study, the more confident and comfortable you feel when it comes to the exam because you, you know it. Um, obviously, there are, there's the pressure of getting the job. There's the pressure of pa passing the exam which will always be there because it's it's a pressurized environment, but you can reduce that pressure by doing the research, practicing the interview skills. Um, and it's quite a simple way to, you know, I suppose, lessen the load on your, on your shoulders as well. Finding the right job. Uh, so this sort of comes into sort of encapsulates everything. The right job, that's a very loose term that I use and people, lots of people use. Like I say, this is the right job for me. Uh, but obviously the right job for some people could be six figure salary. It could be 45 holidays a year. It could be free lunch. It could be anything, you know, it could be traveling. Um, and that all comes down to you um, and what you want, because, you know, you can listen to your parents, you can see your friends, your partners, your teachers, but in reality, it's your, your decision, your job and your, your life at the end of the day. Um, and that's why it's important to really, you know, have a, sort of long, hard look at yourself, but in a positive way. Um, because if you find the right path for you, it's such a much more pleasant walk than, you know, a path that isn't for you because, you know, you, you don't have to go through hardships. You don't have to go through stress. Um, you know, stress will always be a part of life, but having the right job, having that passion there, like that's how I feel in this role now. Um, 
you know, I found a job that I'm passionate, I can utilize what I'm good at. Um, and, you know, I wake up every morning wanting to go to work, not thinking I've got to go to work. Um, and that's, you know, it's a rare thing, but given the right processes, following all the other stuff that I mentioned about, the right job will soon soon appear for you. Um, and it's, it's only upwards from there. So this is sort of wrapping things up a little bit. Um, what sets you apart? Um, as you can see, I've cleverly um, highlighted you because that is the answer to that question. Um, be you. You might think everyone says that, but there's a reason. Um, and, you know, I think of like someone pretending like me at my wealth management job, pretending to be very corporate, cool, pretending to be very serious. It was tiring. Um, you know, I was literally having to lie to myself and to my colleagues that I was this corporate, serious, you know, suits kind of guy um where in fact i wasn't you know i was very much financially minded but i wasn't the serious sort of side of things and it was just tiring it was draining and um, it wasn't good for my for my soul um it wasn't good for my mental health having to you know drag myself through that each day you know five days a week 40 hours a week it's just not good whereas if if you are you you will naturally attract things that are like you whether that's people whether that's opportunities whether that's jobs um and that's it's a really key thing to understand and, and it's being brave to be yourself as well. I, I'm naturally a nerdy person. Um, I'm a, you know, I'd hold my hands up and say I'm a nerd. And during my interview for this role, I remember like listing pointless facts. I got a bit carried away, got a bit excited about it, but they then get to see the real me. And even if I didn't get offered the job, I was proud of myself for being me. But thankfully they, they appreciated that that's who I was and, and sort of, accepted that whereas if you say if i pretended to be very serious very you know didn't smile always got a frown on my face you know i would have to have done that you know every day week in week out and um, and it's just it's just not worth your time you know we're everyone says we're, not, we're here for a, a short time but we're not we're here for quite a long time um you know we spend like 90 percent of our life working so why not make it you know the best place that you do i'd rather spend 90 percent of my time happy than pretending to be something and not and that, again, leads back to being confident in being yourself and being a nerd. If you're a nerd, being sporty, you know, being loud, being theatrical, whatever it is. Um, and a lot of people, you know, with social media, there's a lot of pressure to be a stereotype, fit into this sort of this box, this mold, this ideal person when it doesn't really work. It's not good for anyone. Um, it's not good for the employer if you're pretending to be this person and you're not that person because you naturally won't do a good job because that's who you're not naturally are. Um, so in my role, I talk to a lot of people, have a lot of client meetings. I'm naturally a talker. I naturally enjoy meeting people. It's a perfect match. Who I talk to, they recognize it. They see me smiling. They see the passion coming out. But if I was an introvert and didn't enjoy this and I got this role, imagine the sort of feeling you'd get, you know, trying to have a meeting with someone that didn't want to ask questions and didn't want to talk. just wouldn't work. And it's all, and that's where it comes back to being yourself. Um, yeah, and having a look in the mirror and saying, that's the person I need to be um, and, and not moving or listening to anyone that says otherwise. So the takeaways really um, out of all of that um, is professionalism. So whether that's your social medias, your LinkedIn profile, having a professional look, um, being professional in interviews, um, not turning up, um, you know, unprepared because it, it isn't a professional look at the end of the day and this this doesn't apply just to office jobs it's any jobs um people enjoy and appreciate people that take time out to learn what they do learn how they think and what the business does for example um, and yeah just be professional trust your gut feeling so this comes to you know trusting yourself to find the right job the right job will come along um and trust yourself to be yourself as well, which obviously goes back to the last slide, which is a hard thing to do, but it's a valuable, very valuable thing to do. And it's something I learned sort of later on, sort of a year ago, really, that, you know, to be yourself is, is really the best person you can be. Be prepared, which sort of ties in everything else. Um, you know, being prepared, I sound like a Boy Scout, you know, always be prepared for anything that might happen. But it's true, because if you have a plan, if you know what's happening or what could happen, it's like chess. You know, you always have to plan so many moves ahead um, and it just helps you to be a relaxed person, which in turn, your environment becomes more relaxed um, because, you, you know, you are what you, you think, really. You know, that's sort of my mantra. Um, so, yeah, always, always being prepared. And then finally, I suppose, transparency and honesty. Um, not really spoken about that, but this comes back to being honest uh, with yourself and your employer. Um, but also when I say transparent is, you know, not being afraid to say, I don't know this. Oh, I do know this because, you know, I know many people that have 
you know, managed to get themselves a job on a promise of something that, that I know they wouldn't be able to deliver. And um, so it's like if I promised that I, I was an expert in Excel in my finance job and then all of a sudden was given all this paperwork with numbers on and said, oh, can you put this into a graph and couldn't do it? It's not good. It's only going to end one well. Uh, it's only going to end one way. Um, it's not going to end well at all. Um, and that's where being honest is. Um, and honesty is genuinely the best policy. Um, I do it now. Client meetings could ask me a question about something that I don't know. I won't sit there and give a half-hearted answer or no answer. I will simply say, I don't know, but I will find out for you. And people appreciate that. And honesty these days is a, is a very rare thing. Um, and going back to social media, you know, all the Photoshop pictures and stuff like that. No one really is brave enough to stand above the rest and be themselves and be honest with with society themselves, their employer, everything. Um, and it's something that could really set you apart and is all a part of personal branding as well. So yeah, that's sort of uh, progress in a nutshell. Um, and if you have any questions, as I've always said throughout this, my, my door is always open. Um, so always feel free to drop me a, um, an email, connect with on LinkedIn, um, send me a message, any questions, advice, you know, even CVs and stuff like that. I'm always happy to take a look. Um, obviously, I have to find a bit of time to go through it, but I genuinely, my door is always open because I know the position that a lot of you people that could be in I, on this call, that was me a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and it's it's a great opportunity for me to get to know people, um, especially from DMU as well, being an alumni there. Um, it's Yeah, so yeah, my door is always open. So and I'd just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, hopefully you found some interesting stuff and took away some good lessons. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you very much.